most machines make use of turning parts somewhere in their design. Why is this? What makes turning so special? In this eighth episode of the series on investigating forces, we will find out why understanding turning forces plays such an important part in mechanical design. We will find out all about turning moments or torque, and we will learn how to calculate the torque on an axle. Then we will define mechanical advantage and investigate how mechanical advantage applies to simple machines. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define and calculate torque and define and calculate mechanical advantage. Before we start looking at the actual forces involved when we turn things, let's first get some terminology sorted out. All objects turn around a certain point. This point is called the pivot or fulcrum of the object. This idea of the pivot or fulcrum is similar to the concept of center of mass. It gives us a point of reference to describe the forces that act on the object. The terms pivot and fulcrum can be used interchangeably. For the rest of this lesson, we will refer to this point as the fulcrum. When an object turns around the fulcrum, it can either turn in a clockwise or an anti-clockwise direction. Most mechanical designs include a rounded device or part called an axle to make turning possible within machines. So the turning motion inside most machines happens around the fulcrum of the axle. Having said this, it is important for you to understand at this point that it isn't only round objects that turn and which have a fulcrum. All objects have a fulcrum and all objects, regardless of their shape, can turn. But why is it necessary to know about the fulcrum? To answer this question, let's look at a demonstration. On this block, we have marked the fulcrum. We are now going to apply force to this block at different places on its surface. As we do this, take careful note of the effect the force we apply has on the block. As you watch, See if you can identify the conditions necessary to make objects turn. Do you see that only when I apply a force exactly in line with the fulcrum does the object move in a straight line? Whenever I apply a force at any distance away from the fulcrum, it causes the block to turn. You can also think of this in another way. Unless there is some distance between the contact point of the applied force and the fulcrum, the object will not turn. You should also have noticed that the further away from the fulcrum the force is applied, the greater the turning effect of the force. From this demonstration, we can conclude that we require two things to make objects turn. A force and a distance between the fulcrum and the contact point of the force. The turning effect of a force is called its turning moment or torque. We use these terms, moment or torque, to describe the relationship between the force applied and the perpendicular distance to the fulcrum. Let's make sure that we understand this by defining it mathematically. The turning moment or torque is the product of the force applied and the perpendicular distance from the point of application of the force and the turning axis. We state the direction of the moment as being clockwise or anti-clockwise. Because this definition is so precise, it may sound a little complicated. Let me help you see what it means. Getting to work yesterday took me longer than usual. I found it difficult to steer my car as I reversed out of my driveway, and when I stopped to check the wheels, I found that the right rear one had a puncture. Obviously, I couldn't drive with a flat tire. I had to replace it with the spare wheel. Luckily, I had just the right tools for the job, a jack and a wheel spanner. To change a flat tire, you first need to jack the car up so that the punctured tire lifts off the ground. When the wheel is free to move, you can take it off and replace it with the spare wheel. But it is hard work lifting a car with a mass of one ton. One ton is equivalent to 1,000 kilograms. A car jack is an amazing machine. By applying just a small force to the handle, I can lift a much larger force. We say that this car jack magnifies the effort force as it lifts the car. The wheel is now free of the ground and it's time to change the wheel. 
I'm going to use this practical example of changing a flat tire to clarify how you calculate the torque required to undo the wheel nuts and to explain how a simple tool like a wheel spanner makes this job a lot easier. The wheels of my car are fastened with 15 mm wheel nuts. If I wanted to unscrew the nuts using my hands, I would need to apply a force of about 14,300 newtons to turn the nut anti-clockwise. I know this because car mechanics have a machine that can measure the torque of different sized nuts. But why don't we use the equation we learned about earlier in this lesson to calculate the torque of the force required to unscrew the wheel nuts on my car? Remember, the torque is equal to the product of the force applied and the perpendicular distance from the point of application of the force and the turning axis. I apply a force at this point to turn the wheel nut, point P. This point is at an exact distance of 7,5 millimeters from the turning axis, O, which is located at the center of the nut. The torque that is applied to remove the wheel nut is calculated by the force at point P times the distance, OP. We said that the force required is 14,300 newtons and the distance OP is 7,5 millimeters. Changing 7,5 millimeters to meters, we get 0,0075 meters. The torque is equal to 107,25 newton meters anti-clockwise. The SI units of torque are newton meters. Now, if you think about it, you should have figured out by now that it would be impossible to actually undo the nuts with your hands because applying a force of 14,300 newtons would be like trying to lift an elephant with your one hand. But people change tires every day. That is why we use a wheel spanner. Tools are designed specifically for the job they have to do. So let's find out how much force I must apply to turn this wheel nut when I use a 20 centimeter long spanner and what sort of benefit I will get from using it rather than my bare hands. We can use the formula we have already seen to find the force needed to turn the nuts with a 20 centimeter spanner. The required torque is 107,25 newton meters anti-clockwise. Note, this has not changed. The spanner is 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters away from the wheel nut. We calculate the required force as F equals 107,25 divided by 0,2, which gives us a force of 536,25 newtons. This is considerably less than the force of 14,300 newtons, which actually turns the nut. Pushing down on the spanner with my weight should just about do it. Now that's a useful tool. It enables us to do a job that without it would be impossible. Humans have always used their inventiveness to design machines to make their lives easier. In science, we use the term mechanical advantage to describe the performance of a machine. In other words, how much a machine eases a task. Mechanical advantage is the ratio of the load force to the effort force. The load force is the outcome force which lifts or turns the object on which the machine is working. The effort force is the input force which someone applies to make the machine work. In the case of the spanner turning the wheel nuts, the load force is 14,300 newtons. It is applied to the nut to make it turn. The effort force is the force exerted on the spanner and we have calculated it to be 536,25 newtons. The mechanical advantage of the spanner is load divided by effort force which is 14,300 newtons divided by 536,25 newtons and gives an answer of 26,6. Notice that mechanical advantage is a ratio, so it has no dimensions. It is just a number which tells us how much the effort force is magnified by the action of the machine. We use the symbols MA to represent the mechanical advantage of a machine. We say that all machines with a mechanical advantage greater than one act as force multipliers. 
In force multiplying machines, the load force is greater than the effort. The effort force is multiplied, making it possible to lift heavy loads. So machines with a large mechanical advantage allow a small effort force to lift a large load. They give us an advantage, an edge. They make the job easier. The lever is the simplest type of machine. It consists of a pivot or fulcrum, the place where the load force is exerted and the place where the effort is applied. A wheelbarrow acts as a type of lever. The fulcrum is located at the wheel, the load is placed in the barrow and the effort is applied at the handles. We will model a wheelbarrow using a piece of wood fixed at one end with a load secured to it. Using a spring balance, we lift the handles of the wheelbarrow to lift the load. We will graph the results we get and use this graph to find the device's mechanical advantage. Then, using different load forces, we find out what effort force is required to lift the load. These results are tabulated and we draw a graph of load force on the vertical axis against effort force on the horizontal axis. The results give us a straight line graph which goes through the origin. Can you describe the relationship between the load and the effort force for this model wheelbarrow? Because this is a straight line graph, we can conclude that the load is directly proportional to the effort. This means that as the effort force increases, so does the load that the machine is able to lift. The gradient of the graph gives us the ratio of load force to effort force. Calculating the gradient of this graph gives us a value of 4,2. But what does the gradient of this graph actually tell us? That's right. The gradient is the ratio of load force to effort force, which is, of course, the mechanical advantage of this machine. Now let's look at another example of turning forces in action. These children playing on a seesaw are able to balance it horizontally. How do they manage to do this? Let's apply our knowledge of moments to find the answer. Why don't we start by calculating the torque on each side of the seesaw? The torque on the left-hand side is equal to the weight of this little boy times his distance from the fulcrum, which is 2 meters. His mass is 30 kilograms, so his weight is equal to 30 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity, which we take as 10 meters per second squared. The torque is his weight times the distance from the fulcrum. This gives us an answer of 600 newton meters of torque applied in an anti-clockwise direction. The torque on the right-hand side of the seesaw is equal to the mass of the other boy times his distance from the fulcrum. The other boy has a mass of 25 kilograms and he is sitting 2,4 meters away from the fulcrum. His torque is given by his mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the distance from the fulcrum. He applies 600 newton meters of torque in a clockwise direction. And the seesaw is balanced. It rests horizontally on the fulcrum, not moving up or down. It is in rotational equilibrium. But what will happen if the boy on the right moves half a meter forward? What will happen to the seesaw? In which direction will it tip? And why will this happen? We must calculate the new value of his torque so that we can decide which way the seesaw will tip. The little boy's new torque is given by his weight times his distance from the fulcrum. So this is 25 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared times 2 meters, which gives us an answer of 500 newton meters in the clockwise direction. There is less torque applied in the clockwise direction, so the seesaw will tip in the anti-clockwise direction. The boy on the right goes up in the air and the boy on the left goes down to the ground. This situation illustrates the principle of turning moments. This principle states that a body will not turn when the sum of all the clockwise turning moments is equal to the sum of all the anti-clockwise turning moments. When the resultant clockwise torque equals the resultant anti-clockwise torque, we say a body is in rotational equilibrium. There's another important fact about turning forces that we can see illustrated in this example. When the seesaw tips, the state of motion of the boys 
as well as the state of motion of the axle changes. We know this is only possible if a resultant force is acting on them. Because the difference between the turning moments on the opposite sides of the axle is 100 newton meters, we can calculate the force required for this turning motion to be 50 newtons. Now look at a free body diagram of this scenario. The boy on the left is being pulled down by a force of 300 newtons, his weight, and the force of the boy on the right pushing up with a force of 250 newtons also acts on him. So the resultant force is 50 newtons down. The resultant force on the boy on the right is 50 newtons up. This is a very important principle. Whenever an object is turned, it always affects both sides of the object. There will always be two resultant forces acting at an equal distance from the fulcrum, but in opposite directions. These two resultant forces are called a couple. The couple of resultant forces that applies to all turning actions should not be confused with the Newton's third law pair of forces. Remember, we are talking about resultant forces here. On that note, it is time for your task today. Is it easier to open a wide-necked bottle or a narrow-necked bottle? Justify your answer by experiment. Maybe you think you have the answer already. That's fine. Write it down as your hypothesis and design experiments to test it. This task is an investigation, so there must be experimental evidence to back up your answer. Science is applied to many facets of our everyday lives. For example, the torque that a car engine develops is a measure of its engine power. The engine applies force to turn the wheels of the car. The greater its torque, the greater its accelerating force. We will discuss modern car design more fully in the next episode of this series on investigating forces. So join me again as we wrap up the series on investigating forces. We are going to discuss transport here on Earth and out into space. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.